We all know James B. Stewart as the author of 11 best-selling books, perhaps especially including the Pulitzer Prize-winning Den of Thieves. And as you know, we have not been offering uh, extensive biographies of our speakers in introduction because we tried to provide a, a good deal of that material to you in the written program. But I would like to highlight a few things that you may not know. And one of them became enriched for me during this last panel. I had no idea that German Lieder would lead to someone being a tech entrepreneur or a finance writer. I had no idea. <clears throat> because the fact is that uh, Jim is a classical pianist. My understanding is, and I won't out you on this, but that he manages to practice at least an hour a day. He gives recitals, and he, in fact, sponsored the Stuart Chair in Music at his alma mater, DePauw. Now, Rick, Rich Ekman and I first met Jim, I guess by now, two years ago. We were embarking on this CIC campaign, and as Rick mentioned this morning, there were many facets of it. The, the social media part, the research part, and so forth. Well, one of those parts that we did think was a particularly important was we were gonna go out there as evangelists. Rich and I, hand in hand, we were gonna go out there and be evangelists, particularly to financial reporters, because it was clear to us that they just did not understand, right? <laughs> what tuition was, what, what financial aid students were receiving, what they were actually graduating with in terms of debt and so forth. So we began to go out actually around the country and speak to a number of finance reporters. I guess going back to Greg's remarks this morning, there were no education reporters. So, <laughs> so we realized that a lot of the discussion about higher ed was occurring in that sector. Well, it was uh, an, an interesting illumination for Rich and me because we learned that Jim was not only very knowledgeable about higher education, in fact, very dedicated to his alma mater, DePauw, where he has served, he not only served on the board, but actually chaired the board of that um, university as well. And we learned how committed he was to the idea that we're here to discuss today, that of liberal arts education. <clears throat> in his 2012 commencement speech to the graduating students at DePauw, Jim spoke of defining moments. And I urge you to uh, take a look at that speech if you uh, have an opportunity. He, it includes him discussing a defining moment in his own life, which is very moving and touching. And in that discussion, he interestingly, as some of our other speakers have today, goes back to how in that moment he drew a great deal of support and wisdom from actually his undergraduate education many years before. As our final uh, speaker today, I'm confident that Jim is the perfect person to help us uh, kind of crystallize, in some ways, the defining moments that we've had here together today. Thank you, Georgia, and thank you for all being here. I'm, I'm thrilled to address this august body, and I've been listening to some of the excellent questions, and I really am the liberal arts in action, so I'm happy to share some of my personal experiences. Um, I was thinking of George's excellent essay last night while I was watching the Republican debate. Um, you may, if you've read it, you'll recall that she traced the origin of the liberal arts to ancient Greece, where it, it began as a way of educating a, a free citizenry for the exercise of intelligent democratic decision making. I was thinking, boy, do we need the liberal arts right now. <laughs> I have some personal experience with the Republican uh, front runner at the moment, Donald Trump. Years ago, I was still a relatively young reporter at the Wall Street Journal, and I think he was em embarking on some takeover campaign. He was a, a briefly a corporate raider. And I went up to interview him at his office in the Trump Tower, and I was shown, and we started talking. And during the interview, um, his secretary interrupted us and said that he had a visitor. He said, oh, show her in, show her in. 
So a, a woman came in and he, um, he introduced her. And she, I don't remember her name, but he said she was from the Philippines. And he said, Jim, she is the richest woman in the world. And I said, well, that's interesting. And then he turned to me and he said, Mrs. So-and-so, this is James Stewart. He is the most famous journalist in the world and he's interviewing me. <laughs> <laughs> then, at the end of our interview, I was on my way to Washington. He still owned the Trump shuttle. He said, well, you are taking the Trump st shuttle, aren't you? And I said, well, I don't know. I don't think so. And he said, well, you've got to go. I'll give, you, I'll give you a free ticket. And he started writing out a voucher. I said, oh, no, 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 I can't take a free ticket. He said, well, at least let my chauffeur drive you out there in my car. And I said, no, 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 absolutely not. So I managed, he said, this is an insult. I'm just trying to be, you know, be nice. Anyway, I managed to get out of there without taking either the free ride on the plane or the car. And I'm glad I did, because several months later, the real estate reporter at the Wall Street Journal wrote an article about Donald Trump that he didn't like. And guess what? He immediately countered by saying he'd given the reporter a free helicopter ride to the heavyweight prize fight in Atlantic City, which destroyed the reporter's career. So I know he would have been using that in advance against me. But I'm thinking my liberal arts education, there was so much information to process just in that one interview. He says she's the richest woman in the world. He says, I'm the most famous reporter in America. I realized right then, she is not the richest person in the world, and I am not the most famous person in America. And to be honest, I've never believed anything he has ever said since. <laughs> Well, the fact that I'm standing here today, I owe almost, I feel everything to having gotten a great liberal arts education at DePaul University, for which I do have a great love, and it's become the major cause of my uh, adult, philanthropic cause of my adult life. Um, if you had met me as a graduating high school senior from Quincy High School in Quincy, Illinois, I don't think you would have been betting that I would be giving this speech today. Um, and by the way, the president of Quincy University and his wife are also here today, Bob Gervaisi. So this is a, as is the De president of DePaul University, Brian Casey. So it's, um, I'm delighted they're in the audience. Um, when I graduated from high school in 1969 in Quincy, Illinois, the, the college landscape was, was vastly different. My high school guidance counselor was the assistant football coach. He had two college catalogs in his office, University of Illinois and Western Illinois University. He didn't even have what was then called Quincy College because that was a private school and that wasn't even on the radar. I had to become the de facto college counselor of my class. Now, why that happened, I don't really know, but I was obsessed with the idea of colleges. My parents never really said anything about what college to go to, but they were talking about the importance of going to college from a very early age. I started writing off letters everywhere by the time I was a sophomore in high school, and I had a huge collection of college catalogs in my room that I would share with anybody who was interested, of which there were not very many. About 40% of my high school class went on to any kind of higher education, and that included beauty school. Um, I would say nobody went to private liberal arts colleges almost. Except I wasn't, you know, I was observant. And I looked around the town and I did see that the people who seemed to be the most successful and the most respected had almost all gone to these schools, although there were very few of them. And I would like to say that I ended up picking DePaul for very high minded reasons, but I have to tell you one of the reasons was that my dentist, who was also an excellent tennis player, drove a Jaguar XKE convertible. <laughs> So this was 1969. 1968, you may recall, camp college campuses all over America blew up in student activism. My parents had not set foot on a college campus since they were at Quincy College decades earlier. All of my ideas, I think my favorite college at the moment was Amherst, those things went up in smoke. I was not going to be going to any schools like that or anything that far away from home. So I had narrowed it down to three liberal arts colleges, Carleton, Grinnell, and DePaul because my dentist had gone there. <laughs> so we started at Carleton. We drove up there, beautiful small town, beautiful campus, met the admissions person. About 10 in the morning, we went on a tour of the campus. My father and I went into the men's dorm. My mother wasn't allowed to go in, thank God. <laughs> we got into the lobby. There were 
four or five guys sitting around looking, you know, a little like slackers, and they offered my father a marijuana joint. <laughs> Carlton was over by 10.30. Then we drove to Grinnell. Gangs of hippies were roaming the campus. <laughs> that visit lasted about 45 minutes. I finally got to DePaul, and by the way, there was no plan B. This was DePaul or nothing. I got out of the car, I looked around the campus, and I don't know, it was a miracle. I thought, this is the college of my dreams. It was beautiful, it had trees, it had nice looking students. Little did I, my parents know that during my freshman year, the ROTC building got burned down by student activists. But DePaul was a lifeline for me, and it's why I left a small town where very few people went on to any kind of higher education to where I am today, being able to write a column for the New York Times, write books, to have had an absolutely fantastic and fulfilling career. Um, when I got to DePaul, um, I, I didn't, no one ever told me what a liberal arts college was. It was accepted that that's what you were going to do. And then, by the way, it was a lot more pure in the sense of there was no career counseling, there were no internships, there was no like work study, there was nothing of this. It was a pure approach. This was the ivory tower. You were lucky to be in it. You would accept what the professors told you, and then somehow this was all going to synthesize and change your life for the better, which we just accepted on faith. Nobody was really questioning that. And the classes I took, I remember the very first um, literature course, basic freshman literature course, uh, we read a story. The first story was The Open Boat by Stephen Crane. And the teacher came in and said, what does water mean? Well, water, what, you know, what's that? What kind of question is that? And, well, water is water. You know, at that point, if somebody had pressed me, I probably would have said my favorite book was The Fountainhead by Anne Rand. <laughs> Not because I cared about the philosophy, I didn't get the philosophy at all, but it was a great story and it had sex in it. <laughs> and it was, it, it was no deeper than that. And suddenly, I'm thinking water? So we, we ended up spending a week discussing the symbolic meaning of water in the story of the open boat. And I started to learn how to read that day. By the way, in the financial crisis, I went back to, and reread the, the Fountainhead just out of curiosity. It is so bad. It is <laughs> embarrassing. <laughs> Stick figures, cartoon characters, no subtlety, no dimension whatsoever. But that process began to teach me how to read. And when any, everyone asked me today, like, oh, I, did you like to write as a child? The answer is no, I did not like to write. Did you like to write as a college student? Not especially. They said, well, why are you a writer? Because I love to read, and no one's going to have anything to read if somebody doesn't write it down. <laughs> and I don't think anyone can write until you learn how to read. So my advice is always read, 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 and read more. Um, I also discovered that the teachers at DePaul were extremely demanding. Uh, I was the editor of the college newspaper, which was in itself a time-consuming but fun occupation. And I was taking a course in the New Testament. And we'd, I'd been up all night the night before putting together some expose on the Buildings and Grounds Administration. <laughs> and I got into the New Testament course, and the professor gave us a pop quiz. And I had not done any of the reading. And he said, discuss St. Paul and the meaning of the parable of the wicked tenant. I had not read the parable of the wicked tenant. Well, at least I was honest about it. I said, look, I have to admit, I haven't read The Parable of the Wicked Tenet, but I attended your lectures on the theology of St. Paul, so I'm guessing from the title and what St. Paul was saying. And I wrote what I thought was really a pretty good essay, considering I hadn't read it. <laughs> and the paper came back, F, grade of F, and he said, but that issue of the paper was worth it. Oh. Which really, I was very touched by that, but he didn't cut me any slack. It was a very, um, the, the professors were very demanding, which I appreciate as a, as a teacher today. And it was funny, years later when I got to Harvard Law School where 100 members of my class had gone to Harvard College, once we got to know each other really well, some of them came over to me one day and said, you know, we were really scared of students like you coming in here to Harvard Law School. I said, why? They said, 
because we thought coming from a school like that, you actually had to study while you were at college, <laughs> which in fact was true. Um, I also learned in liberal arts education there a, a generalized distrust of ideology as, a, as opposed to fact that has permeated all of my work. And maybe the most important lesson I learned there, which was completely different from what I was trained in high school, which was and something I continue to teach to my students today, which is the answers aren't as important as the questions. Answers do not teach anyone anything. You do not discover anything from answers. You don't learn from answers. What you learn from is asking questions. And that has infused, two things have infused all of my work since going to DePaul. One is to take the depth of literature and apply that in nonfiction writing, number one, and number two, is to try to expand our knowledge and understanding by asking questions, not regurgitating material that we already know. I think that's become particularly relevant in the world of the digital internet today, where almost everything is regurgitated from something that's already known. The amount of original reporting going on has been shrinking, even as the digital world has been exponentially growing. Georgia mentioned my commencement speech and some of the key decisions in my life. They all were deeply infused by the education I received in liberal arts, and none more so than my choice of a career. When I came out of law school, um, first of all, I probably went to law school because I was trying to sort of thread the needle of things that people wanted me to do and what I myself actually wanted to do. And when I say what people wanted me to do, I'm thinking primarily of my parents who you know, wanted something secure, well-paying, respectable, prestigious. What could be better than, than going to law school except maybe being a doctor or maybe being an engineer? And of that array of choices, um, I was not that interested in, in math or science, although I've become much more interested since then. I figured, well, law is, law is going to be the, the option for me. And I got into Harvard Law School, which was a great credential, and by the way, in many ways, was a great experience. Uh, so off I went to be a lawyer. And I was practicing in a, at a big firm in New York. I guess you could argue that for somebody my age, I was at this big law firm, Cravath, Swain, and Moore, that at the time paid the highest of its associates, the highest of any law firm in the country. Um, and I looked in the mirror one day, and I realized that the people who were succeeding there were not necessarily the smartest. They did not necessarily go to the best law schools. They weren't even the ones who necessarily worked the hardest. They were the ones who were the most passionate about what they did. And I looked in the mirror and I realized I'm not passionate about practicing law. And this is something that George also alludes to her in her essay. How do you, how do you have the, the self-confidence even reach a conclusion like that? That to me was very much rooted in my liberal arts education. Reaching that conclusion also required me to be keenly observant about what was going on around me, especially the promotion process, because there'd be 25 new lawyers hired every year, and maybe one would be made partner at the end of seven or eight years. And I was watching who made the partner. What did they have in common? Why did they succeed if others not fail? A lot of information had to be synthesized for me to reach that conclusion. So I looked inside myself, and I said, what am I passionate about? What am I as passionate about as they are, inexplicably, about the tax code or corporate takeovers? <laughs> um, and the answer was journalism. I had loved being editor of the college paper. I loved working at my local newspaper during summers. Um, I realized that's what I really wanted to do. And so I stunned my parents by saying, I know you, you sacrificed to send me to Harvard Law School, but I'm, I'm quitting the law firm, and I'm joining a startup magazine, by the way, the mortality rate of startup magazines is 99%, <laughs> called The American Lawyer, and my pay is going to be cut by two-thirds. In fact, not only was it cut by two-thirds, five years after I was out of Harvard Law School, they sent around a sort of class summary. They did it every five years. It came in a red binding. And they would give you a little update about what everyone was doing. And at that time, they discontinued this, but at that time, they also gave you information which has now become a national obsession, which is how much are the graduates making? And they didn't put any names on it. You answered a questionnaire, which I turned in. They didn't put any names on this, but they had the highest salary in the class, and they had the lowest salary in the class, and they had the median, and I knew, because I had turned it in, that I was the lowest salary in the class. 
So I did not do it for money, but um, I, had the, I had the confidence to do this. I, I like to think it was intelligent risk taking and that my ability to do that came from my liberal arts college experience. I'm not, I'm not a, a, a wild risk taker. I, I don't want to, you know, I don't want to skydive. I don't want to bungee jump. I don't want to do any of that stuff. But this seemed to me, this was a risk worth taking because the rewards, if it worked, seemed so great. And part of my understanding of that came from another great course I had, 20th Century American Literature, where, you know, I read The Great Gatsby, All the King's Men, and there's one thing that you cannot read 20th century American literature and come away believing money equals happiness. <laughs> <laughs> on the contrary. So that was a, a huge influence on my life work. And I've, I've never made a better decision. I, I've loved making that choice. I've never looked back. I've had a fantastic career. Now, I keep talking about George's essay. It made such an impression on me. But she also mentioned that liberal arts education was originally vocational training for ministers. And I was thinking, wow, you know, liberal arts education is really vocational training for journalists, which then got me thinking, well, are journalists sort of like the ministers of today, or is it, I don't know, anyway, that's another subject. But um, that, is very, that is very true. I mean, it is a very practical degree for, for what I do. Um, let me just give you a few examples. Uh, and they both, they both illustrate my sort of twin goals of bringing a certain literary dimension to the nonfiction work I do, and also uh, informing people and analyzing and, and synthesizing information, which goes beyond simply repeating you know, what happened yesterday. So I was originally covering the legal beat when I was first hired at the Wall Street Journal. I had not been there very long. And one of the big issues of the day was women in law firms. So some editor said, well, write something about women in law firms. I said, well, you know, I'll, when, the, when the time comes, maybe. So I was, I don't know who I was talking to. I was talking to one of my law school classmates in Atlanta. And as you may know, big law firms have these elaborate summer associate programs, and they wind on and take them out to parties and things like that. And at this time, King & Spalding, the leading law firm in Atlanta then, today as well, for all I know, was a defendant in a pending Supreme Court sex discrimination case in which a former lawyer at King & Spalding alleged that she had not been made partner because she was discriminated on the basis of her sex. So my source in Atlanta described the summer outing that King & Spalding had just held for their summer associates, which included a wet t-shirt contest for the women, the women young lawyers uh, at the firm. And I thought, this is a defendant in a Supreme Court sex discrimination case, and they're holding a wet t-shirt contest for the firm? I said, OK, bingo, women in law firms. <laughs> I was on a plane to Atlanta, and I interviewed the winner of the wet t-shirt contest, who, by the way, was very proud of that and very defensive that I would even be suggesting there was anything remotely inappropriate about it. So the story came out, front page of the Wall Street Journal, opening paragraphs, the wet t-shirt contest at King's Ball. A few years ago, for my last book, I spoke at the Atlanta Historical Society. <laughs> and I was at a dinner. Who is sitting next to me but a partner from King and Spalding, he said, oh my god, you wrote the wet t-shirt story. They were still talking about it over 20 years later. And again, a wet t-shirt con contest in and of itself is not newsworthy particularly, but it was the context, it was the symbolism, it was the imagery, it was the literary quality of that anecdote that meant that people were still talking about it in Atlanta after 20 years. And I was thrilled by that. <laughs> I had another story early on. I moved to the mergers and acquisition B. And one of my first assignments was Rockwell International was taking over Alan Bradley, a tool and die maker in Milwaukee. And I thought, hmm, I wonder what's interesting about that, other than the fact it was, you know, at the time, a mega billion dollar deal. So I, I went to Milwaukee. And I learned some really interesting facts that, you know, there's a, I think it's still there. There's this big factory there with this huge clock tower and a big lit up clock. And that was the Allen Bradley factory. And talking to people there, I learned that 
old Mr. Bradley, as everyone called him, had lived in the clock tower. And he was an insomniac, and he would get up in the middle of the night and go down on the factory floor and walk his pet poodle while greeting all of the tool and die makers by name and discussing their lives and their careers and what the company could do for them. Alan Bradley had a symphony orchestra, talk about music, a chorus that would tour Europe every year. And guess what? With, under Rockwell International, all of that was going to be gone. So I, I came back, I wrote the story, and the opening scene was Mr. Bradley and his poodle on the factory floor. My editor called me in and he said, I only have one problem with this story. He said, what is it about? And he threw it down on the floor. This was still when we put it on paper. He threw it on the floor and he jumped up and down on it <laughs> and said, I'm sending you to the remedial writing coach. I said, well, this isn't getting off to a very good start, but um, fine, I, I, didn't, I had never met the remedial writing coach who turned out to be a lovely person. So she looked at it, she said, you know, I don't see anything wrong with this story, I'm sending it straight to the front page. And she did, and the poodle ended up in the, as the lead, and many people came up to me years later and said, you were the first person to get a poodle into the lead of a Wall Street Journal feature story. <laughs> and after that, my editor, I don't think he ever got me exactly, but he never tangled with me again. <laughs> you know, and more recent examples, a few weeks ago, I wrote a column about the coal industry. And, you know, coal, again, that's like Alan Bradley, what's interesting about that? Well, coal is dying. The coal industry is dying. And stocks are plunging, companies are going bankrupt. Um, they basically are no longer lopping off the tops of mountains in the Appalachians. And the reason is not because environmental activists have been marching around, some of whom I've written about. Um, it's because Fracking has produced so much natural gas, which is now so cheap, that all the electric, electrical utilities, which are the biggest customers of coal, are turning to natural gas. Now, isn't that ironic? You know, the, the purest environmentalists, some of them I talked to, they hate it all. Fracking is terrible, coal is terrible, fossil fuels are terrible, oil is horrible, they're all horrible. Even solar has its issues. We, we should all be going back to no, no energy at all. But, what an irony that one of their hated targets is destroying the most environmentally insensitive industry that exists, coal. That to me is one of the fascinating conundrums. I ended up writing a story about Times, put it on the front page, got massive reader interest because of course it not only was about coal, it was not just about environmental activism, but it was about this unexpected paradox. And isn't life like that so often? That's something that I learned in the liberal arts uh, context. Or I had another recent column, one of my favorites. You may recall Google is changing its corporate name to Alphabet. How ridiculous is that on the face of things? But Google had, has, faces a, a fascinating problem, which is that they've been so successful that Google, their brand, their corporate name, has migrated into the dictionary as a standard uh, uh, you know, vocabulary word. It's now in dictionaries as a verb to Google. Go Google somebody. And it's on the cusp of one of those rare examples where a brand is so successful that it becomes generic and it becomes a vocabulary word. And guess what happens then under our peculiar legal system? It loses all of its brand protection. There are estimates that the Google brand is worth $60 billion. And one judge, the day he decides that he hears his kids talking about Googling something, it's gone. So Google has got to move to try to like, a, a, a react to this. So it was a fun excuse for me to describe the creation of language and the migration of brands into mainstream speech. Anyway, all of this has been great fun for me. My liberal arts education taught me to ask questions, and that's what I do for a career. I look for paradoxes. I look for the unexpected. I'm always asking the question, why, how? How could that happen? What explains this? Why is somebody doing what they do? Why is Donald Trump the way he is? <laughs> <clears throat> I have, as an adult, also served on the board of DePaul. I was lucky to be chairman. A lot of good things happened while I was chairman. Um, I was uh, chairman when we appointed the search committee that found 
Dr. Casey. I'm sorry to say that we're now going to be doing another search, but um, that's life. That was one of the most gratifying. My service to DePaul, my uh, participation in the presidential search, my ongoing relation to the school is one of the most deeply satisfying aspects of my entire life. Um, as I said, many good things happened while I was there. There were a lot of things that didn't happen that I wish I could tell you about because I think they're the most significant accomplishments. But even though I love people who uh, talk, I, uh, I respect a confidence and a lot of this I can't say. But I will, as you all know, I don't need to tell you this, every issue in society shows up at a college. And one thing that didn't happen that I'm very proud of the, the school got a gift of this beautiful nature park, which had a, um, a quarry in the middle of it, which had filled up with water. And it, was, it had not been touched by um, development you know, in decades. The, the quarry company, which is the company that ended up giving it to the school, was no longer mining it. It was just sitting out there. So this was going to be this new nature park. It is a nature park. And the, the president and some of the trustees had decided they wanted to build a reflection center on the edge of the quarry. And you can kind of understand this in a way. I mean, the quarry is not a natural thing. It was, it was man-made. But anyway, the students got all upset about this. A lot of the faculty got upset about it. And at one point, um, faculty and students said, it was about, construction was about to start. And they said, if the bulldozers come out there, we are going to lie down on the ground in front of the bulldozers. And I didn't want, I, you know, I don't like to micromanage, but I called the president and I said, do you really want to be, if not on the front page of the New York Times and even the front page of the Indianapolis Star, photos of students and faculty lying down in front of a bulldozer? So that we are not going to be on the right side of this issue. And I will say to the credit of everybody involved, everybody backed away, that it was never built on the edge of the quarry. It was built in a very discreet location. It doesn't interfere with the natural beauty of the quarry. And that, to me, was one of these fascinating conundrums uh, that ended up having a happy outcome. I just want to speak briefly about the uh, challenges which you've been hearing about. I, I'm not going to reiterate most of them. I, I just want to underscore that this is, I think, a time of, I don't want to say crisis necessarily, but it's not a time for any kind of complacency. The world I grew up in, where nobody questioned the value of a liberal arts education, has dramatically changed to the point where it seems like everybody is questioning the value of a liberal arts education. And most of the answers they're coming up with are not particularly favorable. Sitting from my vantage point in the media, the, the, the stories I hear, the anecdotal information I hear, the misunderstandings, um, we, we, all of us who believe deeply in this kind of education have a vast task in front of us. And I think you, you have absolutely identified most of the, the issues and the facts are, I think, on our side, but we need more stories to get out there to refute these things. And one of them I, I haven't heard mentioned but is very real is that liberal arts colleges, liberal arts institutions are perceived as left-wing propagandists. And I was having a conversation with a very close friend of mine whose daughter is a junior at Sidwell Friends here in Washington. And I, we're talking about you know, the, the usual obsession about where someone's going to go to college. And she said, oh, we're, we're not interested in any of those crunchy granola schools. I said, well, wait, wait a minute. Now, you know, they're not all crunchy granola. Wait a minute, what's that mean? This image that somehow they're going to produce you know, people who take those 20th century literature courses too much to heart and not only don't go out and make money, don't even want to go out and make money. This is something that we have to address and combat. I am a storyteller by profession, and I think stories are the way to combat it. Vivid stories, vivid characters, appealing characters, people that other people want to emulate. We cannot do too much of that. And I, I have to tell you that the, the value of the liberal arts education I'm reminded of constantly, not just in my own work, but I did a column not long ago about the art market and the emergence of fine art as now a very significant new asset class, for better or worse. And guess what? Someone at one of the big investment banks in New York was saying, you know, we are desperately looking for 
art history majors <laughs> who can advise our clients because they don't know anything about art. They can do the financial modeling, they can advise the high net worth individuals, but they don't know anything about the quality of art and they don't know why some art does better than others. And I was wanted, to, maybe I'll still do a com on this, but I want to like put it right in front of President Obama and say, look, this country needs more art history majors and they're going to make a lot of money. Surprise. I am very confident. You know, I live in a journalism world that's been under siege now for years. It's, it's much worse than higher education. The, the world is being dramatically transformed. And I'm fighting, you know, I'm fighting for this. Part of the reason I'm at the Times, I, I wouldn't want to live in a world where we didn't have a New York Times and a Wall Street Journal and a Washington Post. Not that they have to be on newsprint, but that the quality of the news gathering, the analysis, the integrity, which is unrivaled in the world, would ever go away. That is, that is so important to me. But we are in a sense of crisis, and we're fighting to, to save these institutions every single day. And I think you, higher education needs to embrace the same sense of urgency. But there's no doubt in my mind that high quality journalism is going to survive. Storytelling is going to survive. Cavemen put stories on the walls of their caves. It is deeply embedded in human nature, the need to convey information, to hand down the truths of civilization from one generation to another. And liberal arts colleges do the same thing. Liberal arts around, as Georgia has pointed out, go back at least to ancient Greeks. They're not going to go away now. But we have got to fight every single day to make sure that that flame keeps burning and that we can give the great gift that we receive on to future generations. Thank you. Yeah, I'm happy to take some questions. I, I, this is a good group. I heard good questions in the other panel. So, I, so are there any? I have, I've tell, the American lawyer, I was in New York at the time, was a big risk. And everybody predicted its demise. And the first art director, the American lawyer, was one of the first, the members of the first class of women at Kenyon College in Gamer, Ohio. So Peggy uh -huh. Good. Oh, I love Peggy. Great. Yeah, yeah, she was wonderful. So any, any questions for Jim? Come on. He's, <laughs> he'll be funny. Yes. Sorry. Excuse me. Jonathan Green, Illinois Wesleyan University. Uh, throughout today's conversations, I think the recurring themes that we've uh, encountered, the uh, cutting edge technologies, new sciences, are all cross-disciplinary. The problems that we're trying to solve that are the most critical are those that transcend disciplines, uh, the depth of scientific research uh, that has been transformed since the 19th century that Katie mentioned earlier when we could know all there was to know. Uh, I think one of the reasons that our, our institutions produce students who end up being successful in those areas is because they can understand where those deep, narrow bands of their research actually fit in in some meaningful way. Uh, but all of our conversations have been about how that interstitial understanding and problem solving is the thing that our students are given the tools to do. And I'm wondering if you have suggestions to us in terms of storytelling where that kind of complex, deep experience that those who haven't experienced have a difficulty understanding. What are the ways that we can tell those stories so that the broader um, folks who haven't been uh, directly touched with those experiences can have appreciation of how important it is for our society that we do foster that claim? Well, I, one of the great virtues, I think, of the liberal arts education is that it does, it transcends um, narrow sort of technological issues. I mean, to me, journalism and, the, and liberal arts are very, very closely aligned in that they are, at their best, seeking truth. And that's a quest, that's an endeavor that has no particular te technological dimension. The technology may be a means to achieve that end, but how you find it is ultimately requires you know, the human brain. It requires synthesis, analysis, taking information, thinking of it in creative ways, in un unorthodox ways. And I try to teach my students at Columbia that I, I don't care what medium they end up using. They can visual, radio, audio, digital, online, print, you know, dying, but print. I'm completely agnostic. I, I don't care at all. I have this, exactly the same goals. 
which is to find the kind of stories that illuminate important issues that move people and that they will remember and therefore to change hearts and minds. And by the way, another thing, again, I don't care what the technology is, but something the liberal arts colleges do very effectively that does not happen much in other schools is getting people to tell stories in the first place. And one of the great revelations for me always is when, especially in the books, when I've done all, all of my research, and then I simply start to put the information together in chronological order, amazing insights emerge. That doesn't happen much in daily journalism because information is conveyed as it is learned. So no wonder, you know, after a while, people are reading about, you know, negotiations with Iran, they throw their hands up, you know, so I don't, it's too complicated for me. Because it's, they've gotten the information like Jackson Pollock took it and threw it on a canvas. <laughs> but if you step back and then untangle that information and simply line it up in chronological order, you start to see things like cause and effect. And I think great insights can come from that process. The process has nothing to do with actual technology. Now, I'm not a particularly technically efficient person. In fact, I had, I had to get help to tune in the Republican debate last night. So many remotes you know, around the TV, it was confusing. But, um, but I, I can learn and I can adapt. I, was, I, I started writing an online column, I think, in 2001 or two, some, something like that, I mean, when they were really, really very new and, and daring. So when I have to, I, I will adapt to the technology. But to me, that's, that's kind of, you know, that's sort of the window dressing. Um, that's, that's the cart behind the horse. I, I hope that answers your question. Maybe not, but <laughs> thank you. No protest. Yes, ma'am. Please identify yourself. Mary Ann Benninger, Drew University. I'm, I'm listening to you, and it's clear to me that you're, uh, you're very much a data-driven person, and that's why you're good at what you do. I think a conundrum we have is that the data are on our side, but we've learned over and over again that our penchant for trying to use data to convince the world of something doesn't work. And I hear you saying, use stories instead of data. Yes. Is that a fair characterization of advice that you would give us? Yes. I was looking at your charts, and there are very compelling. But you, lead, you need a liberalized education to understand them. <laughs> <laughs> You're way overestimating the, the capacity of the average you know, person to synthesize this information. But I see time and time again, you bring in characters, you, you bring in real people to illustrate, 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 dramatize, dramatize. That is what people remember. One powerful image of a real person who doesn't fit the stereotype of the wealthy elitist going to one of these schools is going to do more than reams of data. And then you've got the data you can tuck in, you know, you, you, you entice them with this fascinating story and then they swallow a little medicine along the way and that helps convince them. But it's the stories that will draw this. And I know you're doing this. You're, you're rounding up stories. And I don't think you can do too much of that. And, and you need young people, too, because you, you, you have a limited constituent you need to reach, at, at least in many ways. The, the young people, their parents, guidance counselors, there is a finite world there. And each of those audience, I'm not a marketing person. I'm sure you know, there are some people that you have access to that can help with all that. But each of those sort of target groups needs its own story. And when I was you know, uh, a student, I was very susceptible about what other young people I admired were doing. And liberal arts colleges have a wealth of fantastic, I mean, DePaul alone, I could, you know, I meet these kids out there, they're amazing. And every school's got people like that. And if kids saw this, they'd want to be like them. I'm enormously comforted by this because I have a chief communications officer who is new to my institution, and her mantra is, show, don't tell, show, don't tell. I think it's the only thing that the woman can actually say, is show, don't tell. <laughs> we have completely revamped our admission collateral on that mantra. So um, we've done exactly that. We have only videos of students speaking to students in their own words, completely unscripted, about 
um, their experience. And it's yielded so much fruit because the data are then following it exactly as you said. So um, thanks for that confidence in what we've tried to do. Sure. Other questions? Yes, in the back. Oh, right here. Right here first and then in the back. Steve Briggs at Perry College, and I was interested in your uh, connecting journalism with liberal arts. Often I've talked to editors and they say that journalism, they don't major in journalism, major in something else and then become a journalist. And so as a journalist, you're drawing on that. Uh, I talked recently with a trial lawyer who said the key to her success was being able to tell stories well and being able to analyze, research, synthesize, and then tell the story. So. I, um, and another friend who went to law school to get liberally educated after a geology degree. Do you see a connection between law and storytelling and liberal education in the same way that you do with journalism? Oh, absolutely. Uh, law and journalism have a lot of similarities. I was, I had the, you know, at times painful but very revealing experience of being a defendant in a libel <coughs> lawsuit as a result of Den of Thieves. The, the Milk and Camp sued me. The lawsuit went on for 11 years, and they were seeking $35 million in damages. So every time I'd fill out a credit application, they would say, well, do you have any contingent liabilities? And I'd say, yes, how much? $35 million. <laughs> I mean, the only thing good I can say about that is I always got sent to the supervisor. <laughs> but, um, but anyway, I, I won resoundingly. But in the course of this, I always wanted to rewrite the briefs and make them more interesting and put more drama into them. And, and the, the lawyers would say, no, you know, please, you know, we, we, we're writing for one reader, the judge. We know him, you know, let us do that. I said, okay, fine, fine, I'll go along with it. Um, but they were telling a story. I mean, they had to put it into their own stylized, coded, jargon-laden, you know, way, but they were telling a story. And, that, and I tried to keep them focused on that. I said, you know, look, I'm, I'm, this, I'm just this journalist. I was just trying to reveal the truth about the most powerful person in American finance, and they're, they're throwing these armies against me. You know, let's don't lose sight of that. That, to me, was a, I'm the David here. So let's, <laughs> don't forget the, the storyline. So I was, I was very much you know, trying to do that all the time. But, but I was in litigation myself. That's always about telling a story. Um, Corporate negotiations about understanding, you know, the other side, uh, which reminds me of Donald Trump again, but I'm not going to go down that road. So, <laughs> but yes, the short answer is there are many parallels, and I and I don't think that's unique. Uh, I think many fields have certain things in common, and I would tend to agree with the advice that if if you want to be a journalist, you you certainly don't. I don't think I would recommend majoring in journalism as an undergraduate. I mean, maybe, depending on how broad the other experiences are. But I was this weird sort of area major in political science and French. And that was great for being a journalist, or I, I suppose anything else, really. I'm always dismayed when high school students tell me they know exactly what they want to major in and what they want to do. And I think, so sad, you know. <laughs> Have you really explored all these wonderful, crazy options out there that you may not even know about? I mean, had I, I, I grew up in, in Quincy. There, I knew the editor of the local newspaper, but basically nobody really made a living as an author or as a journalist in it there. It was only when I got to New York that I saw this was a viable career path. So I'm always disappointed when I see people cutting them off, themselves off too soon. Thank you. Thank you. I think there are two attributes you need when you go to college, not to have any idea what you want to do and to feel guilty about not having any idea of what you want to do. <laughs> Thank you. Please go. Uh, Katie Conboy. I'm the uh, provost at Simmons College in Boston. And my daughter just launched a journalism career with a major, double major in French and political science. Wow. So I'm, I'm seeing great things for her right up here, <laughs> right up here on the stage. Um, what I wanted to ask about was this word action, which has been sort of in the mix all day long behind everybody, the liberal arts in action, this uh, banner. And some of the ways I think that we've been thinking about action have been about you know, uh, civic engagement and applied liberal arts, where you're taking your science and you're actually doing something with it, or you're taking whatever discipline you're, you're studying and you're doing an internship, you're doing some, something that takes it out into the world and puts it into action. 
I think what I felt you might have been getting at in your talk was something that might have been a little bit more about uh, imagination in action, but I'm not sure. So I guess I wonder if you'd even just elaborate on what you might think of this word action as resonating with for you. No, that's a, that's a good point. I think that is something I was getting at. I mean, I, I have to admit that I was just in the super check, supermarket checkout line one day, and I was kind of thinking to myself, I wouldn't mind having a job like that for a while. You know, you know exactly what you have to do. You just show up, and the customers come by, you ring it up, and they go go away. Of course, I know. Of course, I'd be bored in an hour or two. But it was contrasting to the fact that nothing happens unless I make it happen. I mean, I wake up every day and have to, not every single day, but every week or every pretty often, and I have to create something out of nothing. If, if I don't come up with ideas, and if I don't go out and ask questions, I don't set up interviews, nothing's going to happen. I don't make any money. I don't produce any, I don't have a career. And that's both great, it's a fantastic opportunity, and at times it feels like, you know, a little scary. You know, it's not just going to happen. It takes a tremendous amount of initiative. And by the way, I think that's one of the reasons I've enjoyed my work so much, but it, it, that to me is what, uh, you know, that is liberal arts in action. I mean, what are you, what are you doing in school? You're, you're creating something every day. I mean, somebody is there to help you, but they don't give you the answers. You have to, you have to do the analysis. You have to ask the right questions. You have to do, you have to go through sort of a very similar process. It's a very active process. I mean, it's, it's a creative one, which I think is, you know, it's fantastic in terms of satisfaction and fulfillment. Um, but it's kind of like a muscle. Um, and if you don't exercise it on a regular basis, it stops working, which is why it's hard to, like, to do what I do part time. It, it'd be nice at my point in life saying, oh, maybe I'll just write one or two articles a year or something like that. But that, I don't see that's going to happen because then the muscle gets weak. It's that constant like thinking and thinking in this creative way and thinking in a disciplined way that yields those ideas, and that's the lifeblood of, of what I do. So in that sense, yes, it's a very active application of what I learned. It's really thinking all the time. If there's one more question, we can take it. Yes, sir. Jorge Diaz Herrera from Duke College in upstate New York. Mm -hmm. Today we heard a lot about technology and liberal arts and the like. And it just occurs to me that probably we're looking at it from the wrong angle. See, technology is the application of science. And digital technology is the application of computer science. So I was wondering if what we should be talking about is whether computer science should become a bona fide important liberal arts subject, liberal arts subject, maybe even general education. Uh, it has foundational, theoretical uh, fundamentals that are long lasting. And it might even have a practical application in the sense that we'll be more comfortable in, in, in making use of the digital tools uh, today and into the future. It's like when you learn a language, foreign language, like I did with English. Um, it's not because I'm going to become a translator or anything like that. It, it, it gives me an, an opening to a new culture, a new set of uh, concepts. Same thing could happen if you learn a computer lab. So the question is, should we treat computer science as a bona fide liberal arts subject and perhaps even part of the core? I think the answer is yes. Um, I mean, one thing we've seen, the liberal arts, they have evolved over the centuries. And they should. And I think you said it perfectly. It isn't computer science a language? I mean, isn't really mathematics a language? Isn't this a means of, of communication, of, an, of analysis? I remember when I was at DePaul, I think I might have been a sophomore, the first computer science course was introduced into the curriculum. And there was a huge controversy about it. A lot of the faculty were up in arms. They didn't want it. They said, no, no, this is vocational. This is not a legitimate subject. But it went in, and now it's a, a huge part of the curriculum, and I think a very, very legitimate one. Um, and again, I think how it's taught is really what distinguishes it 
as, as a liberal arts subject. If it's, if it's purely applied computer science where you're given a specific task and this is the technique to do it, you're not going to learn to think very creatively about it or apply it in other contexts. But if you look at it more broadly as, as say, a language, then I think the, the potential is limitless there. I think, of course, it belongs in the curriculum. Thank you so much, Jim. Thanks Jim a lot. Stewart, ladies and really gentlemen. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.